So uh, welcome, friends. And um, so this session is one in which we want to um, share some reflections about uh, writing. Carol and I have both been, been doing some, uh, done various kinds of writing. Well, Carol will say more about it and introduce herself, and then I'll introduce myself. We're, we're going to each take about 20 minutes to share some material that we hope will be of interest and informative or provide insight, but also stimulate some thinking that then can go into uh, small group discussions that we'll have after for about 20, 30 minutes before we go into their worship sharing as a whole group. Okay. So, okay. Go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm Carol Woolman and I'm a closet writer. And I'm a closet writer because I believed I couldn't write when I was young. And I wrote a journal starting when I was 11 and I didn't tell anybody about it, and I did it pretty much every day for some years, and um, it was more like Dear Diary, I did this, I did that. So then I got to high school, and we were supposed to write five paragraph themes, and I said, I am going to flunk high school, because I can't write. And writing in a diary wasn't like writing an exploratory <coughs> paper for teacher. So anyway, I kept doing the closet writing and saying I can't, I'm not a writer, until probably, uh, let's see, around 1980, I started doing what I call mission writing. In 1980, I took a trip to the Arctic, a rafting trip, about 400 miles, and it was all above the Arctic Circle. And I had a wonderful experience with Quaker Eskimos in Yupiat people. And I wanted to give back what I felt they had given me from that experience. And so I wrote my first piece and gave it to Friends Journal, and they published it. So that was the beginning of what I call mission writing. And another time I wrote a story about a little girl who was severely handicapped, and I knew her mother, and I grew up with her. And it touched me, this story. And so I um, wrote that story, and it was published by Catholic Digest. So I'm kind of an ecumenical writer. <laughs> and. So I want to share with you about the book that I have written, and it's now at the publishers, Maine Authors Publishing, and hopefully it will be out for um, in the next six months. Um, I had a tragic experience in 1998. My son Mark, this is Mark when he was little, um, Mark was murdered in San Antonio. And he was he was a uh, professional trombonist. And he um, went to the Juilliard School. And we had high expectations and hopes for him. And he had them for himself. And he was 25 when he was shot to death in his own doorway. And it's been 25 years. So we've had him on the earth as long as we've lost him now. And so time went on, and I, I really wanted to do something. And I was gathering stories about Mark, and I thought, I want a full picture of him. I don't just want my idea of who he is. So I, I had about 50 stories that people had given me. I'll click on there was one. And um, I gathered these stories, and I gathered the photographs, and I gave them to a local editor, and she went through this book. And I met her at the Jessup Library, and I said, Mel, my heart's not in this book. I feel called to write another book. 
she meanwhile had just taken this whole manuscript and written notes on it. She said, put this away, put it in the box, don't even look at my notes, and start writing the other book. And just keep going on it. Don't worry about how to write it, just start writing. So I thought, what a generous person, actually, you know, to do all this work, and that I'm basically ignoring what she given me and to start out on this other book. And the other book is this book, and it's called Ecology of Grief, A Mother's Witness. It is not a how-to book. It is definitely a book about grief and the dark and numbing pain of it, but it is also about adventure and joy and mystery and meaning. And so I'm hoping that this will get out there and be of use to others and be, um, I call it a companion in book, a book that can go with you, a book that can be with you, a book that says this person understands what it's like to go through this kind of experience and this depth of loss and can actually live through it. In the beginning, I was what I call falling down in pain and grief. Just, you know, could not imagine getting one foot in front of the other, getting one day linked to another, that I was going to survive this. And I really needed something that told me how to survive. And so I'm hoping what I've written is a book about that experience. It's, um, it's my story, and it's the story of, of living through one day at a time. Um, so that's what happened when I didn't get the directions I expected. When I, got the, when I got the information from the editor, and she said, never mind, just go and start writing. Um, Now, I'm just reading the notes here so I can tell you um, what happened What happened when I was nine years old. So this is part of this story. When I was nine years old, I was a little, um, I was a little Sunday school girl, a little farm girl in a Baptist church. And I, um, you know, had a lot of Bible stories by then. And one night I was getting ready for bed and I heard a voice in my bedroom, because I was standing there, and the voice said, go to Italy, go to Italy, go to Italy. Well, nobody went to Italy in my <laughs> hometown of Elma, New Jersey, <laughs> unless it was for the war, you know, unless they were in the military. And so I was kind of like, oh, I know about Jonah, and Jonah was told to go to Nineveh, and he didn't go, and look what happened to Jonah. <laughs> you know, that's pretty serious. And um, so I went downstairs, my mother was still up. I went downstairs to the den, and I said, Mom, I just heard a voice that said, go to Italy. And she said, go back to bed. <laughs> so, I, I said, I'm not telling this story again. I'm not telling anybody about this. So I didn't. But when I came time to be like 14 and go to high school and pick my courses, I picked Latin. Because Latin was the closest thing I could find to Italy. And I took four years of Latin. So, I, I went on, lived my life, married, had children, and I was, you know, going on a trip, and we went to France, in the south of France, and we went through a tunnel into Italy, and I thought of this story, and I thought, huh, I wonder what's going to happen. Nothing happened. <laughs> and so I, we did a U-turn and went back into France. Another time I took a ship and landed in Genoa, 
And I thought, well, maybe this time something will happen. And I went right to the Rome airport and home from there. Nothing happened. <laughs> and so then I went to a Pendle Hill event. And it was a spiritual autobiography. And I wrote this story. And everybody there sitting there like you are, well, what happened? What happened when you went? And I said, nothing. <laughs> I said, I didn't go. And, and they said, why not? And I said, I didn't get any more directions. <laughs> so when Mark died, I went to Pittsburgh to visit a friend who had sent me a ticket to come and just, she said, there's so many people here who want to hug you. Now that is a line to remember because mm -hmm. it is a wonderful, wonderful feeling to know that people want you and people want to be close to you. Um, so she said when I got there, oh, I have tickets down at Heinz Hall in this program from a, a writer of children's books. And, um, he wrote a book called Cathedral and all these beautiful, fine line drawings. I think his name is David McCullough. And she said, would you like to go? Or if you wouldn't, you know, I understand. And I said, yes, I'd like to go. What is the lecture? It's about Rome. And so when I got there, there were three big screens set up and they had these drawings of places in Rome and it was from the point of view of a pigeon. And this pigeon is flying like under archways and over buildings and around. So it was kind of fascinating. And then after that, um, I said, oh, what's this book? And here on her radiator cover was a book. And this woman had been to Italy to write a book. And she had a, some Rockefeller Foundation grant or something. And I thought, oh, that's kind of interesting. And then I went to New York after that to visit a friend. And she said, would you like to go to Tuscany with me? And I said, what is this about? So I called my friend Kathy in Pittsburgh. And I said, Kathy, do you think I'm being nudged to go to Italy? And she said, no, Carol. I think you're being clobbered over the head. <laughs> And so I began to try to find out how I was going to go. Well, meanwhile, I'm, I'm a widow for a year. My husband had died the year before. I'm, I'm a practicing uh, therapist. And you know I'm not um, usually just taking off jet setting across the world and spending a month somewhere. And so I didn't know how I was going to do it. And I read in the New York Times about staying in monasteries and convents. So I asked my Catholic friend, Edith Snyder Lyman, who's your sister, <laughs> Will's sister. I said, how do, how do I find out about this? And she said, I have no idea. I've never heard of it. So time went on, and it was almost time for Mark's birthday. <laughs> and I had no idea how you celebrate the birthday of a dead child. And at this point, I began to think about that, and I began to imagine what it would be like. And I, I decided that it would be a good idea to go up Cadillac before the light of the morning and see Orion come back. And Orion was kind of there's a star in Orion that was kind of given to me as a Mark star. It's another story. So I thought I could maybe see Orion come back into this hemisphere and then be on Cadillac and go to the sunrise and then go down and go to Champlain Mountain and climb Champlain to the summit. And that would be my sturdy ritual. That would be something that I could do and that would be uplifting. So I did that, and then I came home, and on my counter, I found a book, and it said, Bed and Blessing, How to Stay in Monasteries and Convents in Italy. 
from Edith, who had left a fair that morning. And so I began to plan and I actually went to Italy. And the third place that I went was in a monastery where St. Francis of Assisi received the stigmata, the marks of Christ in his hands. And, the, and, and while I was there, I was having dinner with a priest, Father Severio, and a young businessman from Livorno named Federico. And one night I came down for dinner and they said, you must go to Jerusalem. You must go to Jerusalem next. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and I had no idea of going to Jerusalem, ever. And so they said, yes, you must go. And I thought, well, listen up, Carol. This is, you're here for directions. So they told me about their experiences. I inquired of their times there. And they said, yes, you must do this. And I thought, OK, just tuck this away. And when I got home after a month away, I had five messages from Jerusalem on my answering machine. And I didn't know the person. I waited up an hour, it was midnight. An hour later, it would be 7 in the morning in Jerusalem. And this woman said, we'd like you to come for the millennium celebration. We want to have a, a celebration and a concert in Mark's memory. He came here in 1994, and we loved him, and we wanted to do something for him, and we want you to come. Would you please come? And so these are the kinds of what I think of as spiritual turnings of my writing and my life. And so the work that I've done in writing this book has been to um, pay attention to these things and to document them and to give them out as uh, hope, as mystery. Not that I understand, not that I deserve it, but that it's been what's given to me. How am I doing on time? I don't know. I had 11. Yeah, so. About right? Yeah. OK. OK, so let's see if there's anything else to do. So after 47 years, I went, I did this trip to Italy and, um, and wrote this book that is about living through the violent death of a child. Being the mother of a murdered child is painful, of course, but it has a dimension of being um, shameful or something that you, you tend to you know, might not want to talk about. Or you might think, oh, if somebody asks me about it, they'll say, what happened? What did he do? What, why, you know, what caused him to be murdered? And, or they'll go, oh, no. And, you know, they'll shrink away from you. So when you, when you are dealing with this kind of mammoth grief, uh, it's important to think about how much you want to get into the weeds with people that you don't really know. So anyway, thank you for coming. And that's a little bit of my story to whet your appetite. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sarah. I'm quite early. Share some material from a book that uh, came out recently from Quaker and Super Future. And um, I've written out my comments. I may add a few things as I go, but I tend to rattle on because I have so much to say. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I thought I'd write it out, and most of it's majority will be actually quotes from the book that I wanted to share with you that I thought might be appropriate for today. 
So a few years ago, I found myself writing a book on some of the big freaking problems that we face as a species. Um, ecological collapse, climate change, wars of mutually assured destruction, and especially um, the threats of runaway technology with artificial intelligence. It was all very systematic and, and sort of big picture, you know, I teach philosophy and peace studies and, and AI and other things at College of Atlantic. You know, and so I tend to think a lot in terms of academic context and theories and so on. Um, and I was rushing to find answers to these big problems. I wanted you know, sort of rigorous theoretical answers with very concrete practical applications and actions that we could take to deal with. And I was doing better on the theory part than on the practical in some ways. But then had the good fortune to collaborate with a writing group at the Quaker Institute for the Future. Uh, QUIF, or the Quaker Institute for the Future, was founded 20 years ago as a Quaker think tank to work on social and environmental problems with research informed by Friends Values. But it also quickly developed ways of doing research in a distinctive way, informed by Quaker practices. The idea was to take what we learned in clearness committees and Quaker meetings for worship for the conduct of business and apply it in what we call meetings for worship for the conduct of research. So working out of the silence, trying to do spirit-led research. And I started working with a circle of discernment, applying those practices in research on artificial intelligence. And part of what it led me to was reflection on how big picture questions have been related directly to my personal life experience and my family growing up, both myself and then later raising kids, my own. And that led me to some really basic insights about how we should start thinking about public policy and ethics in general. And one key insight that grew out of paying careful attention to some of the pains and traumas and problems that I had experienced with family and with ways in which they and I tried to be loving <laughs> towards each other. It led me to the conclusion that one of the most common and basic ideas about love, which was ingrained in my early Sunday school experience, I grew up in a Methodist church, um, one, one of the most basic ideas was fundamentally wrong. I'm talking about the golden rule. This idea that you should do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So I'd like to share something from the start of the book that grew out of that reflection and insight. And um, so let me just kind of jump into it. Okay. My grandmother thought of herself as a good Christian. She grew up in a well-to-do German-speaking home in Baltimore. And she married a successful businessman who placed her in charge of a large household with servants where she exercised a strong sense of authority as the matriarch of our extended family. We gathered often at her house for events like Sunday dinners after church and touch football on the lawn. She had strong and definite views about what, when, where, and how people should eat, relax, what they should wear, how they should dress, educate children, and so on. But what she thought of as generosity was sometimes not much appreciated. Her decisions could lead to all kinds of tensions, frustrations, and even scandals amongst my parents, brothers, aunts, uncles, and cousins, as well as the African Americans that she employed as cook, groundskeeper, or nanny. She thought she was following the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you but the results often let, left others feeling quite unloved. Many of us in this extended family had very different interests, preferences, tastes, perceptions, and views of the world than hers on issues like breastfeeding or belonging to a union if you're an electrician like my dad was. So in treating us as she would want to be treated, she treated us in ways which we did not like at all often. <laughs> It could feel less like love and more like self-centered, oppressive control over our lives. 
when I was 10, the extended family tensions helped precipitate a nervous breakdown in my own mother, leading her to drag me and my brothers and my dad off to a new home 500 miles away up here in Maine. Other tensions led a cousin to serious behavior problems that resulted in addiction and eventually death. These seem to be clear cases of the golden rule not working out well. The number of cases in which the golden rule has not worked well suggests the problem is not with the people practicing it, but with the rule itself. Consider, for example, the case of missionaries trying to live out their Christian faith by going around the world to do good for others. Often well-meaning Catholic monks, evangelical pastors, Quaker school teachers, and others have gone to great sacrifice to bring basic necessities of life to indigenous communities around the world. But they've done so as part of an effort to share religious beliefs and practices to save their souls. From the missionary's point of view, if he or she was a pagan living in unbelief, what they would want most would be for others to do unto them the act of conversion, to convert them to Christianity. They would want this even if it meant destroying their traditional forms of marriage, family, farming, and communal life. They would want this even if, in the words of the 19th century American teachers, including Quakers, at the Indian boarding schools, it meant killing the Indian to save the man. The problems with the golden rule begin to come up when the people we are dealing with are not like us. If their cares, concerns, values, cultures, and ways of looking at the world are different, then they may not want us to treat them the way we ourselves would like to be treated. They may not like that at all. Instead, they may quite naturally want us to use their views and values to decide how to treat them. This world is a rich and many colored place with all sorts of interesting variety in it. To treat people well, we need to be mindful of that, understand their context, and try to walk a mile in their moccasins. Even if we don't speak their language or understand their context, we need to respect their differences enough to ask them how they would like to, us to treat them, rather than assume that we know based on our own experience. Instead of viewing the world through a monochromatic golden rule, it seems wiser to follow the rainbow rule. Do unto others as they would have you do unto them. So I've got another little section about parenting daughters that illustrates this. I'll share with you. I grew up spending a good deal of time outdoors, and clothing was a tool that enabled me to bushwhack through brush and catch trout in a cold spring stream. As for how my outfits looked, getting muddy and messed up was inevitable. And I wasn't going to be staring at any mirrors out on the trail, so why care? Later, as a parent of young girls, I found myself in repeated conflict whenever we dressed and packed to go on some outing here on the island I was raising. Attitudes and practices around clothing are strongly influenced by a variety of cultural values and institutions which are typically strongly informed by patriarchal gender systems. But in conflicts with my daughters over dressing for these outings, for quite a while I gave no thought to such larger considerations. I, I thought my daughters were each just plain foolish in what they kept wanting to put on their feet and wear as outfits. I would try to make them dress in the ways that I was, I was sure were appropriate for their own good, <laughs> only to hear a stream of whining and refusal. But then I began to have conversations that shed light on some related questions, like, these were real big questions for me, why do girls like to play at dressing up and having weddings? <laughs> Why do women sometimes spend an hour or more a day getting dressed to go out? 
Why did they puncture holes in their ears so they could hang things from them that might get caught in their hair? Why would they wear shoes that made it hard to run and get out of the way of an oncoming car? I found these questions puzzling in a very basic way. Uh, until I heard some replies. Like, great, the way you look affects the way other people perceive and experience and relate to you. And relationships are central to life. It makes sense to practice dressing up for special occasions and play imaginatively at taking part in events that may be among the most decisive in your life. Reflection led me to see my daughters had a systematically different way of looking at the world. Contrasting viewpoints like this provide great material for comedians. They, they can make us, it's good, they can make us laugh uproariously at the incongruity of the two points of view. For example, Dad, we're going to hike the rock face of a mountain where it might suddenly rain and you want to wear those flimsy little shoes? Daughter, you want me to go out in public where I might see my friends or meet some new boys? And you want me to wear those ugly, big, clunky things on my feet? Dad, nobody's going to care what you look like when you're out tromping on the trail. Daughter, if nobody's going to care what I look like, then why are we doing this in the first place? <laughs> Dad, because it's an adventure. Daughter, what is wrong with you? Why are you so weird? <laughs> Just like other people in positions of power, parents can feel they have the right as well as the duty to impose their judgments on others for their own good. The golden rule invites us to just that way of thinking. To children in subordinate positions of power, such impositions can seem self-centered, uncaring, unloving, and egocentric. And there's often considerable truth in that perception. But typically, the person in power means well. In trying to get my daughters to dress as I thought appropriate, I was trying to do right by them, given my world view. In that sense, the conflict here was between two communities, me and fellow adventurers who didn't mind looking a mess, versus my daughters in their world of women who cared very much about appearances and how they framed and affected relationships. Much everyday conflict at home, work, and the world at large turns on differences like these. I found solutions to the great clothing wars by backpacking extra clothing for when the cold and the wet made them ready to sacrifice appearance for comfort. <laughs> On their side, they learned to negotiate plans for outings and preparations, including clothing purchases that allow them to dress in attractive ways and, and, and bring friends. Two things softened me up over time for these negotiations. First, I recalled how I had felt as a child when my mom and grandmother had imposed their clothing preferences on me. And second, my daughters <laughs> became increasingly effective in nonviolent, though sometimes not very civil, resistance to my authority. <laughs> Maybe you've been there. Their complaints, non cooperation, and boycotts <laughs> took a toll. They also gave me pause to consider if I was missing something important. These encounters illustrated three basic lessons. One is, in dealing with people, it is better to start with the rainbow rule and negotiate ways to treat them as they want to be treated. And then second, the rainbow rule requires skill and conflict resolution to develop solutions everyone can agree on. And then third, Nonviolent resistance can be powerful, and when we act on the golden rule by imposing our values on others, we do, so, we do so at our peril. So, uh, those are sections from the book. I, in, just in closing, I'll note 
that switching to the rainbow rule involves challenges. We have to learn to listen and hear what others want and find ways to take everyone and every creature in the community into account. Deal with disagreements, uncertainties, and reason dialogically to resolve conflicts and use nonviolent methods to discern moral truths that can guide us. But it is my experience that there is a light that can guide us in doing so. And it is there in each and every one of us, ready to shine through and make way open. So in, in the book, I go on to try and think about, well, so how do you do this in economics and politics and with technology? And how, how can we get these newfangled AI that seem conversational and almost dialogical, like ChatGPT, that maybe you're starting to seem almost like they're, mm -hmm. like they're persons, like, like children or something. How can we raise ethical AI by becoming a more ethical village for them to grow up in? So thanks for letting me share that. And um, yeah, there are copies of the book out here. If anybody wants a free review copy, or there, if you if you want to just buy one for personal use, they're, they're, yeah. they're ten dollars for the author's discount. It's also there's an electronic version PDF that's available uh, on the website for it. If you're interested in that, just let me know. I, I have a thirty year old daughter living in Belfast who's participating in a play, a masker's play. And I asked her what her role was, and she says, well, I'm the daughter of a crazy father. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, oh my god. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thank you, Greg. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you all. So, uh